This is the second episode in a bonus series of Real Democracy Now! a podcast talking about deliberation, culture and context. What do we want? Real democracy! When do we want it? Now! What do we want? Real democracy! When do we want it? Now! Welcome to Real Democracy Now! I'm Nevek Thompson and Real Democracy Now! is a podcast for people who think we can and should improve how democracy works. This podcast looks at democracy from different angles to help you think about how democracy might be improved. Welcome to episode two in this special bonus series of Real Democracy Now! a podcast about deliberation, culture and context. This bonus series has been made in collaboration with the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra. In this series, I will speak with a number of people who participated in the Centre's recent conference, which brought together scholars from around the world to examine the different forms, meanings and significance associated with deliberation in various cultures and contexts. A copy of the conference program is available in the show notes. This conference was supported by John Dreisek's ARC Laureate Fellowship, entitled Deliberative Worlds, Democracy, Justice and a Changing Earth System. In this episode, I'm speaking with Professor Melissa Williams. I'm Melissa Williams. I teach political theory at the University of Toronto. So I've been working at at the intersection of three broad areas of inquiry, thinking about globalization, democracy, and this field that's called comparative political theory. Comparative political theory, broadly speaking, is about uh, efforts to decenter Western political traditions in the way we define the field of political theory. So I've been trying to understand basically how, what are the prospects for democracy under conditions of globalization, and why is it important for us to look to traditions of political thought outside the West in order to understand those democratic potentials. Melissa spoke on day one of the conference about deparochializing democratic theory. And you've come along to the Deliberative Cultures Conference and you've given a paper called Deparochializing Democratic Theory. That is a hard one to say. Can you tell us a bit about what that paper covered? Yes, well, it begins with this this challenge of how we put these three chunks together of thinking about democracy under conditions of globalization and bringing in the diversity of thought traditions around the world that might be relevant to thinking about democratic futures under conditions of globalization. What I do in the paper is to first just lay out that there are a number of different ways we can combine these terms. One is to begin with uh, with a focus on democracy and to think about how the study of non-Western thought traditions can inform democratic dialogue to address global problems, the problems that emerge, problems of common concern around the world as a consequence of globalization. So climate change is is one obvious example there. Uh, And so the argument there is that it's really important to see how people in different cultural contexts construct the problems that we all confront and whether or not they use similar terms for situating those problems in relation to uh, their broader understandings of of, of politics. So that's one way of of approaching this combination. Another is to select certain practices that we take to be fundamental to democracy and to the generation of democratic legitimacy. And that's where deliberation comes in. Most of the papers in the conference were really focused on practices that we can, from a distance, say, bear a family resemblance to one another and and be appropriately clustered under this heading deliberation, even though many of the people engaging in these practices would never use the word deliberation to denote what they're doing. A third approach, the one that I'm adopting in the paper, is to begin instead from a different term, the term democracy, and then see how people are using that term and inflecting it with ideas drawn from their own cultural inheritance. Now, there's a lot of methodological throat clearing up front in this paper. One of the things I'm I'm trying to do is to address the question or the problem of theory building, what would it what would it look like if we were to try to 
develop democratic theory for a global age in a way that takes other thought traditions seriously. And so there are all kinds of challenges to doing that work. One is uh, that we want to avoid biasing our encounters with, with other cultures of politics by reading out of them only those features that confirm our conceptual and normative commitments. A political theorist, uh, Bonnie Honig, has called this problem or the, the risk that of finding Kant in every culture. So there is a little bit of a danger if we come to an encounter with another culture uh, looking for deliberation, then there's a risk that we might only find those features of the culture that confirm our commitments to deliberation. Uh, so anyway, we have to, and similarly with democracy, so we have to be mindful of the, the biases that we bring to our inquiries. So the way I frame the problem of the paper is to ask, well, given the contemporary debates in democratic theory about the possibilities of of democracy under conditions of globalization. What are some fairly thin reference points that we can turn to to guide our search for cases where, so we're looking for resources in non-Western thought to use a very fraught way of characterizing this kind of cross-cultural engagement that can inform our theory building enterprise. So we need to then characterize what the theory building enterprise is at this stage of uh, the historical development of democracy. And so, so I position the paper in relation to a dual challenge that democratic theory has to confront under conditions of globalization. And the first is that because uh, globalization generates collective action problems that exceed the boundaries of territorial states, then we need to think beyond territorial states as the site for democracy if we want to if we want to devise democratic responses to those collective action problems and of course there's been a great wealth of new work in in political theory trying to rethink democracy under conditions of globalization that takes these cross border relationships and and interdependence seriously Broadly speaking, there have been three camps that have emerged in those debates. The, the statists, those who think that democracy needs to be contained mostly at the uh, and institutionalized mostly at the scale of the state. The cosmopolitans who are aiming for the institutionalization of democracy at the global scale. And then transnationalists who think that no, things are more complex and we need to recognize uh, transnational structures of power and institutionalization as themselves also sites for democratization. In the paper, I'm not taking a position in relation to those debates, but rather arguing that notwithstanding the, degree, the disagreements across these positions, they all have a certain background presuppositions that we can draw upon to find the reference points from which then we can begin looking for cases of non-Western ideas about democracy that can inform uh, these ongoing theoretical debates. So the background presuppositions that I focus on are the spatial references that are common to these debates uh, around democratic theory in the global age, namely that whatever their views about where democracy should be located, there is agreement that uh, we need to be paying attention to politics at the global scale, to politics at the scale of the state, and to the transnational dimension of politics. So I use these spatial reference points as very thin and so presenting less of a risk of biasing our search for cases, but still substantive enough to orient uh, the search for cases. And, and so then I turn to another criterion for case selection, which is that ideas about democracy ought to be action guiding. And so taking that idea as my starting point, I then look to agents, that is significant political agents that are already uh, pursuing political agendas 
And invoking the term democracy in describing what they're doing when they act politically, and then turning to to see uh, what content they give to the idea of democracy. And I look for agents invoking democracy in their political activities at each of these three scales, at the global, the state, and the transnational scales of politics. So taking those kind of methodological intuitions forward, I examined three cases. This is really an illustrative and exploratory story or exploratory paper just aimed at, again, trying to give a rough answer to what it might look like if we were to turn to non-Western thought as a resource for democratic theory building in the age of globalization. And so I can't do justice to any of the cases that I actually examine, uh, but nonetheless, I take the risk and identify these three cases. So the three cases are at the global scale of politics, the invocation of the Confucian idea of Tianxia, which means all under heaven, as a way of, uh, as an idea that's been invoked by Xi Jinping in China to describe what he calls major power diplomacy with Chinese characteristics. The democracy piece of that is that he links this concept to the goal of what he calls democratizing international relations. So I then investigate what he means or what is, and in in official party documents, what is meant by this term, democratizing international relations, and how it connects to the invocation of Tianxia, which is a very old idea in Confucian thought. So in the second case is also a Chinese case uh, based on research done by Mark Warren and Bao Gong He on uh, the practice of authoritarian deliberation in China. That is practices of local democratic deliberation that are being sponsored by the Communist Party of China, which generates all kinds of paradoxes insofar as you have an authoritarian regime at the scale of the state, which is nonetheless fostering policies that intensify democracy at the local scale of politics. The third case is from a different part of the world. It's the transnational peasants movement, La Via Campesina, which is now a global movement banning some 70 countries involving some 200 million people based on uh, defending the rights of, of peasants against the encroachment on their forms of life by Uh, international economic development policies that displace people from the land and pollute the land and so on. So in each of these cases, I also then look to theorists who have done some of the work already of reconstructing these core ideas into a theoretical account of democracy. Putting these things together, then I try to draw some conclusions for some desiderata of democratic theory under conditions of globalization and some challenges to some of the familiar approaches uh, or familiar assumptions in existing democratic theory. One of the things that emerges from these bringing these cases together is that it's not only the three scales of politics that I initially identified as common to the debates around democracy in the global era, that is the global, the state and the transnational that are pertinent to thinking through democratic futures under global uh, under conditions of globalization. Uh, And that is the local scale of politics is absolutely crucial to bring into the picture. The importance of the local comes through both in the authority authoritarian deliberation case and in the La Via Campesina case. In the authoritarian deliberation case, what we see is, I think, contrary to many intuitions about the about democratization, which is that democratization might proceed uh, at the local scale without necessarily having any implications for democratization at the scale of the state. In La Via Campesina, what we see is the importance of the uh, the local organization of peasant uh, practices of, of democracy, which really begin with the local environment of, of a particular organization of, or community, but then 
scale up by identifying the structurally similar circumstances um, that peasants face in relation to, for example, neoliberal economic uh, development agendas, regardless of the location they're in. So there's a, a logic of uh, translocal uh, solidarities that emerges as very important in La Via Campesina. And the movement as a whole is really built upon these translocal solidarities that are informed by the, the idea that regardless of the radical differences across communities, uh, that they all stand in a similar uh, structural position of power and of disempowerment by now globalized agendas of economic development. Uh, so the local scale is really important to bring into the picture. Another thing that follows from this is that in thinking about democracy in the global era, we need to be thinking systemically. How does democratization at one scale of politics interact with uh, democratization or the absence thereof at other scales of politics? Um, so the, uh, the paper as a whole ends up affirming the, the importance of systemic approaches to thinking about democracy and deliberative democracy in the global era. One thing that jumped out at me when you were talking was, was to what extent have you, been, have you thought about or have you actually seen that the word democracy itself has quite a different conceptual meaning for different countries, for different cultures? It does have a radically different meaning in different contexts. And so, so I think a, a really important question to ask when we're exploring what democracy means uh, when it's invoked in different cultural contexts is that, well, we're tempted to ask then what is the common denominator? What, what account or what concept, what, what statement of the concept of democracy could capture all of these different usages? What I'm sort of arriving at is that Democracy entails a commitment to sharing a common world on terms of political equality. I think that very generic statement of what democracy is does capture the different usages across at least the examples that I've encountered. The trick comes in when you try to then unpack the concept of political equality. Who or what are the units or bearers of the claim to political equality? That's where a lot of the differences play out. So to take the example of Tianxia and this idea of democratizing international relations, there are actually three different accounts of political or who are the bearers of the claim to political equality that are invoked in, in, that, uh, in those discourses. So on one account, it's really a, a justification for, for China's work in building South-South relationships and challenging the dominance of the global North in global institutions and creating institutional, alternative institutional centers of power that, for example, the Asia Infrastructure Bank and such, that will help to um, equalize the, the power relations on the, on the global stage. But another meaning of democratizing international relations is much more conventional. It appeals to the equality in international institutions of sovereign states. The third meaning, though, as, which I think is most interesting for theoretical purposes and for ways of thinking about democracy in the global age, uh, also most interesting from the standpoint of the project of comparative political theory, is the assertion of a claim of the equality of civilizations or the equality of cultures, which then points us toward an idea of global democracy as a dialogue among uh, equal but deeply different uh, civilizations or cultures. You mentioned the importance of not just finding what you're looking for, finding things that actually match your uh, approach to democracy or your understanding or your conceptions. How do you do that in practice? Well, I think to do it well it involves going far beyond anything that I am in a position to accomplish, certainly in a paper of this sort, um, which is entirely parasitic on the scholarship of others. I think to do it properly, one needs to learn the language, the history, the context, and then to do really careful work in conceptual history and in, in the structure of discourses to see how 
you know, the term uh, democracy is being used in relation to other other concepts that are part of political discourse. So there's a lot of work of, you know, history of ideas and the reconstruction of a larger, I use it in my paper, I use the, the, the term and the concept of social imaginaries or democratic imaginaries. So really what we need in order to get to the point when we can have serious and deep theoretical engagement uh, across culturally different ways of thinking about democracy we need really uh, this kind of uh, deeply immersed, immersive and deeply contextual interpretation and reconstruction of the democratic imaginary that's being expressed in, in speech and through political actions, through political performances. So that kind of work, I think that's the real work of comparative political theory. I don't consider myself actually to be a practitioner, properly so-called, of comparative political theory because I haven't done that immersive work. Thankfully, there are a lot of scholars out there who are really starting to do that that kind of work, uh, which adds a lot of resources to our capacity to engage in in theoretical debates across cultures. Is there anything else you'd like to cover off uh, in regard to, you know, your approach to this area of research? One of the things I haven't spoken about is the way in which La Via Campesina, this transnational peasants movement, has drawn on uh, ideas that are indigenous to, to peasant culture, which itself is a somewhat odd construction because, of course, peasants exist in all uh, in all cultures around the world. So it's one of the things that I find most interesting about the La Via Campesina case is that uh, one of the practices that they that they use to express their ethical purpose is a ceremony called La Mística, which opens their meetings. They're democratically organized at local, national, regional, and global levels. At, at each of these levels and each of their meetings, they open with this ceremony in which there's a celebration of the three elements uh, that are common to peasant culture, peasant life anywhere in the world. So soil, water, and seeds. There's a quasi-sacred quality to these elements. and, uh, And through these practices, there's an expression of a certain ethical relationship to the land and to the rest of humanity that peasants are performing uh, for the sake of humanity. This invocation of a sort of quasi-transcendental order of the meaning of the political practice that they're engaging in, of their understanding of what they're doing when they're they're acting democratically and striving for more democratic global institutions is, I think, very interesting and something that gets missed in a lot of, um, or that that is about which contemporary democratic theory is relatively silent. That is, to what extent do people invoke transcendent orders of meaning to inform or to make sense of their democratic ethos. We find this appeal to a quasi-transcendent order of meaning as well in Tianxia theory, this idea of all under heaven. In one interpretation, the interpretation offered by the philosopher, the Chinese philosopher who's done most on this concept, Tianxia includes uh, an obligation to not only to all humanity, um, but also to the earth itself. So there are resources here for ecological understandings of democratic responsibility that include responsibility not only to other humans, but also to the earth, to the land, that again make this appeal to something that is quasi-sacred or something quasi-transcendental. And this suggests that when we're thinking about democratic theory in the post-Westphalian age, we might also need to be thinking about democratic theory in a post-secular age. And uh, here I'm invoking Charles Taylor's idea of, of, of a post-secular age uh, in which there's a need to move between and to accept the co-presence of, of both deeply secular views about politics and those that 
invoke transcendent orders of meaning. And, the, and, and so there needs to be space uh, for both ways of understanding democratic political responsibility, ethical responsibility as part of uh, global democratic theory. I was really interested to hear that what you were going to say were the, were the, was the common aspects amongst the transnational peasants movement. That's incredible, isn't it, that despite there being 70 countries and I think you said 2 million people, mm -hmm. that there's three elements common for all of them that are crucial to, to their life and culture. That's amazing, isn't it? I've, I've found it both fascinating and, and yeah, very powerful. It's also been very powerful as a medium for identity formation and, and political mobilization, that, that this message, that these three elements are essential to peasant forms of life, regardless of yeah, the context in which peasants are, are working the land, has proven very potent as uh, an instrument of political mobilization and, again, of identity formation. And what's also really interesting is to see now one of the, the terms that they use to describe their own democratic agenda setting within the movement is a, a dialogo de saberes, a dialogue among knowledges. So the valorization of peasant knowledges, um, all of which uh, have to touch on these elements, that you have to have knowledge about which seeds to use, about you have knowledge about the water conditions, knowledge about how healthy the soil is, that these peasant knowledges are, are valorized in their democratic practice, but there's also a recognition that there needs to be translation across cultures of how, how these knowledges are articulated. So there's a, a, a sharing of knowledge across cultures, which is also then symbolically represented in these opening ceremonies, in which these three elements are then celebrated, but in the, the, the cultural idiom of the peasant culture in the location of the meeting, wherever in the world it might happen to be. Uh, so the, the ceremonies take different forms, they're accompanied by music and so on, that are indigenous to the peasant culture of the area where the, the meeting is taking place. And this seems to be very powerful, a, a powerful source of meaning making that serves to solidify a sense of solidarity and within the movement from, from the sources that I've read. In future episodes of this bonus series, I'll be speaking to other people who presented at the conference about their papers, as well as some of those who are on the final round table reflecting on the conference overall. I hope you'll join me then. Thanks for listening to Real Democracy Now! You can find more about today's topic in the show notes at www.realdemocracynow.com.au. If you enjoyed this program, please subscribe to this podcast, write a review, share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation on the webpage or on Facebook or Twitter. I'd love to know what you think is the essence of a real democracy.